أحمد وصلي على رسول الكريم أما بعد فقال عز وجل والله بكل شيء بصير رب الشح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأهل الأقدة من لساني يفقه قولي آمين يا رب This human attribute that is a sense of being watched the sense that we have that we are being watched is a very interesting one and some philosophers like Lacan and others have commented on this sense of being watched even in terms of physics some people have talked about it in terms of the observer and subjectivity and how it affects things i don't want to talk about the the this from the aspect of physics today and from the perspective of quantum physics alone it's very interesting but today i want to talk about it from some philosophical aspects and then some quranic slash uh aspects that have to do with the field of purification of the soul <clears throat> so there is this thing called ego ideal ego ideal is this sense that you're being watched by your ideal let me give you an example when an athlete is playing a game and the spectators are watching him he has a sense of the spectators are watching me the gaze of the people is on me but there is also a sense of being watched uh that is constant and always there in every human being and there's a sense of being watched by uh let's say this athlete's really good and people appreciate how good of an athlete he is or let's say there's a philosopher and he's really good and he wrote a book and the book is like the best book he's ever written and he's like only if plato and socrates and the other big giants of philosophers if imam ghazali could see my book he would appreciate it so much because it's such a good book that he's not even concerned with the people that are his spectators in his world he's in his ego ideal he's looking at someone other than here he's looking at someone other than here and that is according to some uh, psychologists from an existential perspective that is the best form of life the form of life where you are living an ideal and you feel that ideal is judging you and you feel like that ideal has some sort of gaze upon you has some sort of vision upon you like allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for example and living our ideal in the way the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam we're always judging ourselves and we're looking at the prophet and the people are looking at us from the perspective that i'm judging myself oh what would the prophet have done my gaze is always there and so this there so there are two two aspects to what i want to talk about the first is the sense of being watched this persistent insistent uh never letting go feeling that i'm being watched why does human being have this in the first place and then second is there an ego ideal or ideal ego what do i mean by that the ego ideal is looking at something beyond the here and the now and beyond the spectators to another world so for example if i'm giving a speech here <clears throat> and i know people are looking at me but i'm constantly in a state of remembering that my gaze is on someone else is on something else my gaze my gaze my internal gaze it's almost my focus is on something other than here in terms of what my mind is looking at alam tara did you not see meaning with your mind do you not see your gaze your eyes is somewhere outside here so the two aspects one that 
the persistent uh, feeling and sense that I'm being watched. Whether that is through the angels or whether that is through the jinns or whether that is by Allah himself. And therefore Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Shahid Allah. Allah is the witness. Allah is the witness. Allah is the witness and we are a witness that Allah is a witness because we have a sense of being watched. It's an inner sense that exists. And number two, that this inner sense of being watched, is it egotistical? Okay, Is it an ego ideal meaning? Am I here being observed? I'm observing someone, someone is observing me. And do I have an ideal in my mind that I feel that ideal is watching me? Or do I idealize the fact that people are watching me? So, uh, let us say, just as an example, a final example to this point. Let's suppose I was a basketball player and I was a student of Michael Jordan. Very good basketball player, best in the world. Let's suppose Michael Jordan no longer exists. Now, when I'm playing basketball, I'm not so concerned with what people think, how good my basketball game is. I'm more concerned with what, my, what Michael Jordan would have said. What would have he said about this particular play that I just made or this particular shot that I just made? What would have he said? That's where my, that is an ego ideal. Now I'm holding Michael Jordan as my ideal, constantly pre pretending in my mind as if he's watching me and I'm in communication with him. So this is the interesting thing, is that we make gods out of many things. We make gods out of many things. But what this, where this belongs, this sense where it should primarily belong. And there's nothing wrong with having a pious teacher and reminding yourself that, oh, what would have my sheikh taught, thought of this? Or what would have uh, my sheikh thought about what I've been doing for the last one year, for example? Let's say I'm making YouTube videos, what would have my sheikh thought about that? What does he think about that? So, uh, <clears throat> you know, so, so there's that, there's that ideal of someone watching you. It's that sense. And then you have your ideals watching you constantly. Everyone from, let's say, your teachers to maybe even your parents to Allah Himself subhanahu wa ta'ala and Allah is a witness. Shahid Allahu Annahu La ilaha illahu. And Allah is a witness, there's no divine. But Allah is a witness means He's watching. In Allah Bikulli Shayim Basir, Allah has insight into everything. Uh He's with you wherever you are. He is with you. He is watching you. And man has this unceasing feeling and sense of being watched and sometimes we're in touch with this feeling of being watched and sometimes we're not in touch with this feeling of being watched but it is there it is how we've been made and the and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made us that way so we can recognize that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is also watching us so I find this very amazing, you know, because I don't think that uh, like a rabbit would think, uh, I wonder what my parents would be thinking about what I've been doing for the last one year of my life. I don't think a rabbit would think that Allah, meaning Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has the ability and Allah has given consciousness, life, in consciousness and recognition and intelligence to inanimate objects like the tree that was crying in the area 
where the Prophet used to give the khutbah, or the rocks that were used to say salams to the Prophet So, uh, you know, th th this is a reality. And so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can give consciousness to anything. Everything in the heavens and the earth is praising Allah. And so we have this innate sense of someone's watching me. And we have this innate sense of being with or in, in idealizing or having our gaze on someone other than who is over here. And so when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, remember that Allah is watching you. Or when the Prophet says, worship Allah as if you see him. It is not, it is wondrous and amazing that we even have this quality to begin with. And so from this perspective, some of the psychologists, they've really said some very interesting things, you know. And in the in in and in, in part of where does the sense uh of where I'm where I'm being watched come from, right? Uh part of it is also connected. See, this sense is intricately connected to our ego. Because when we're children, we're under the supervision of our parents. When you know, when the Quran says "Wahadaynahu najdain," and we guided him to the two mountains, and many of the scholars took this as the the breasts of the mother. And read if you read Freud, or if you read Klein, or if you read uh, Lacan and some of the other philosophers slash psychologists. This is what they say. They say that, for you know, they weren't sure, like Freud wasn't sure that when the baby is with the mother, if it knows a separation between the mother and itself or not. Now we know that that's most likely true. But the baby certainly knows when I'm with the mother, I feel good. When I'm not with the mother, I don't feel good. And so when I'm in the mother's gaze, because the baby can see up to the, the face of the mother. And so when I'm in the gaze, in the presence of my mom, it's good. And when I'm not in the presence of my mom, then the baby starts crying. This is amongst our earliest experiences. And so, you know, this this thing is really embedded in us, this idea. You know, and, and so while, you know, even though Freud ended up saying, you know, that because this is a union between the baby and the mother uh, via the, her breasts and the milk and, and the child feeling good. And what's... Uh, Interesting is this point has been made in other parts of Islamic literature also about the same point that Freud made, but Freud made it in a very pessimistic, negative way about the, the mother in the milk. Islam saw it as a very positive thing, okay, a positive relationship. Uh, and anyway, even though Freud never really talked about a bad mother as such, uh, as some of the other thinkers did, but what I want to come to is that, you know, even though they had this kind of like understanding, and we guided him to the two mountains or the two breasts, right? That's what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, just a child comes out and he knows. And he knows this is what will make him feel good. And and, and many of the scholars of, of, of purification of the soul, they say this is where kind of like the beginning of the beginning of the making of the ego starts. Because the ego wants. Now, I'm not talking about ego as some psychologists and philosophers have defined it because they've all defined it in different ways. I mean it in the sense when we say I or the, the sense of the ego in terms of the way that we understand the word culturally. Okay, And so the ego is built via this process of milk from the mother. because, And then you have to wean it off. And this is taskiyat nafs. This is like training the child or the human being you can't have something you want and and you have to adapt and so that's like now why am i saying that i'm saying that because uh their observations about this seem to be very chronic now on the other hand uh and 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 you know this this union of uh the mom and the child uh is is kind of like the idea of love right uh, the ideal love is of the mother and the child, even symbolically. But then the, the comfort the child gets from the mother and her milk, uh, that is love is union, is oneness, right? When you become one with something. 
And so even though, you know, these psychologists, some of them made some very good observations, uh, but they also made some very terrible and terrible observations. But this sense of being watched is there. You know, like one example of like a very, uh, you know, like one of the things that Freud said, interestingly enough, is that, you know, that uh, everyone has an ego and the ego gets bigger and bigger. Uh, again, I'm saying this in the cultural sense. And uh, and then, you know, but if you would live, believe in another life, right, then you're deferring your ego. Uh, like y y your, your ego would have been manifested here. And this is the problem. People that don't believe in another world, then they have to manifest their ego here. They have to an manifest all their energies and all their ego for this world. But if you believe in another world, then, you know, then you're, that your ego is kind of like on hold uh, to that world. And then, oh, when I get into Jannah, then I'll have everything I want, which is why it's not considered the highest position. The low, the lowest is, you know, I, I'll do what Allah wants me to do so I don't go to the hellfire. And then the second is, I'll do whatever Allah wants so I can go to Jannah because that's what I want. That there's a certain egoness in that. And then finally, the highest is, uh, is that you do, what you do to me be, uh, for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and that's nasbul ain that's the real purpose is the happiness of Allah and that's selfless because your your obje object of ideal is someone other than yourself and so what is one Allah akbar and the happiness of Allah is the biggest thing and so it's not about protection from the hellfire even though we all want that may Allah give us all protection from the hellfire and we all want jannah inshallah may allah give us the uh, nearness to jannah by our actions and by our words ameen uh, but the real thing is the pleasure of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala his gaze to be able to see him right again being in the presence of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that's the greatest thing but freud had this idea that you know people are all egomaniac even religious people can be and you know freud didn't really care about religion uh, he tried to avoid the subject as much as possible. And even when he was challenged by some of his uh, readers, uh, he gave some very weak answers to, to those questions, which I'm not going to go into right now. But, but uh, you know, Freud basically said, well, you know, you, you're, just, you're just delaying your ego for another time, another, another place. You know, I'll just, if I don't have everything here, I'll just get it over there. And that's fine according to the Islamic uh, paradigm. Just the fact that you can have the patience to, to wait, and that means that you are cutting, cutting your ego in a sense. But yeah, you're then saying, okay, I'll get what I want, but in the next world. And, um, and, and Islam is fine with that. For many reasons, which I'm not going to go into, but I was only mentioning this critique that, you know, Freud, Freud's maybe one of his biggest critique of religion is this. Um, and so we do have a sense of being watched. And just as we have a sense of being guilty, if feeling guilty, if we do something wrong, if we lie or cheat, we feel guilty. And we also have a, have a sense of being watched. And I think that's very, very profound that we are beings that have a very strong sense of being watched. Uh, when we're alone in a room, sometimes we it's easier to actually imagine being watched, right? Uh, and, and so on and so forth. And it's very interesting that when you cut off yourself from all your senses, so like if I was to turn off the lights, when, when you can't hear anything, you can't see anything, and you're all alone, sometimes that sense of being watched is heightened right and that's why it's sometimes easier to remember allah subhanahu wa ta'ala when you cut off the lights and all sounds and all distractions so i just thought i wanted to talk about this sense of being watched and how it plays a spiritual role in our lives and please comment on my point about this and uh, let me know uh, if you agree with uh, what I said and what the other uh, philosophers and thinkers, even though they weren't Muslims, but they made a good point, uh, which 
is you can say uh, in this instance in this instance uh, is in uh, harmony with the teachings of Islam okay okay inshallah assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi